Well, thank you for coming forward. We all can turn around and say hello to Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. We're here. <laughs> okay, so let us... This is a beautiful day. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. God bless all of you. God bless your families. Some have been away, Katrina and her family, and have come back, and we're glad to have them back. And Eric's been away for a little while, and he's been back, and a lot of us have been busy over the summer, and it's always nice to come back to our home and be around family who love you, wish you the best in life, who care for you and support you. It's good to have people that love, care, support, and understand you. And that you're not facing the things you're facing alone. That we have one another. And that's what today's sermon is about. It's about having someone by your side that will go through life with you through thick and thin. Who will always be there even when you make mistakes, even when you fall, even when you fail, but will always be there to hold you, your hand and give you encouragement and pick you up and walk with you. And that's what this message today is about. And this message comes from the life of Gideon. Sometimes we wish for things to be the, we, the, the way they used to be. We long for things to be the way it was when life was good. And I grew up in Marion. It's a small, small town in Wayne County. It's all apple orchards and cattle, cow farms, dairy farms. Um, we did have a grocery store at one time, and that closed. There's not a, there wasn't a police station in town. If you needed the police, they had to come from a neighboring town and drive about 10 miles. Um, the big news that was made national news last year is that they got a family dollar. And that was national through Facebook. Um, I grew up with a family of, there were seven of us children and my parents, and we spend the summers outdoors, and we would build forts in the backyard, and my brothers would get some kind of reeds or branches, and they would just knock down all the big, tall grass and the weeds that grew up in our backyard and clear, you totally cleared it out till it was flat down to the ground, dirt level. And then we would take away all the brush and put it over by the creek where we would um, hunt for crayfish and for tadpoles and whatever else we could find in the water. And which we would go into that water with our bare feet and there was always this big black snake, a water moccasin that would swim right by us while we were playing in the creek. And we would watch it go by, and I would still be in the water and watch the snake go by. And it was probably, it had to be about six feet long. We weren't afraid of it. We would just watch it swim by. And then we would go back and dig up, pick up the rocks and look underneath to see if we can find salamanders and crayfish and get the tadpoles. So, and I know water moccasins, now that I'm older, are poisonous, and I probably... All of us probably could have been killed, but we played in the water. We didn't have an awareness of the danger that we were in. So we spent a lot of time outdoors playing with one another, and just we built forts and make mud pies and just had a lot of fun outside with the neighbors. And I know time, times have changed, and kids are more indoors now, and they're on the video game. But back then, if you look back at your past in your life, you think, that's when life was good. You know, I didn't have any responsibilities when I was a child. All I had to do was get up in the morning, in the summer, and go outside, and I had the whole day to play. We would come in probably around 7 o'clock in the evening when my mother would tell us it was supper time, and we would eat. And that's how we lived. And then you grow up, and things change. And then you have responsibilities, and you have a family of your own, and there's less outdoor playtime, and things change, and we long for things to be the way they used to be. 
Sometimes we're in marriages that were absolutely wonderful and we loved and we cared for one another. And things happen in the marriage and the marriage separates. And now you're faced with living life alone. And you have to establish a new pattern of life because now my life isn't like it used to be. And I want things to be how they used to be when I didn't have so many challenges and so many struggles. I want to be at the place where it was when, when life was full and, there, and my marriage was happy and my family was happy and, and everything was together and perfect. And so we reminisce about the times when we believed things were good for us and we had the best things in life and everything was perfect and we were happy. And we miss those days. Well, the story of Gideon... It starts out with them being under oppression. The Israelite nation, God had led them out of Egypt where they were in bondage to slavery for 400 years and brought them through the wilderness, through the desert places and steered them around tar pits and danger and they even fought battles while they were in the wilderness against other nations that would come out to fight them. They eventually make it into the land of promise, the land where all their dreams would come true, the land flowing with milk and honey, where they would have everything that they could ever need. And when God brought them out of Egypt, he gave them the wealth of Egypt. They had the best clothes. They had jewelry. They had riches because the Egyptians gave it to them. God made the Egyptians to bless the Hebrew people. And so they left with great wealth. And they enter into the promised land. And we know that it was a struggle to enter into the promised land because nothing in this life comes easy. Anything good that God wants to give you is not going to come easy. Even though God is giving it to you, there's still going to be a struggle for you to get what you want. There's still going to be some obstacles that you have to overcome. There's still going to be some things that you have to stand up and face. And these things might seem mountainous, they might seem large, they might seem huge, but in order to get the blessing that God has waiting for you, you're going to have to confront fear. You're going to have to confront doubt. You're going to have to have faith and trust in God. And so the Israelite people at the border of Canaan, they confront their fear, and they trust God, and they have faith. And they enter into the promised land. They take over city after city. The walls of Jericho fall down, and the land is wide open before them. And God drives out their enemies. But not all of them. And so Joshua, he gives the people their allotments of land. We know there were 12 tribes of Israel. For those of you who don't know, there were 12 tribes that came from 12 sons. So each son, their family was so huge that they called that family a tribe. And so the 12 tribes each had their own portion of land to live on in the land of Canaan. And this one particular tribe, this tribe was called Manasseh. This is the tribe that Gideon was from, and they had the largest portion of land out of all the tribes of Israel. Well, it says that they did evil in the sight of the Lord, which is often what the Israelites, we see in the book of Judges that there's this cycle of if they obeyed God, then God would bless the people. If they disobeyed God, then God would turn his back away from them and allow the surrounding nations to oppress them. And he, that he made a covenant that as long as you're my people, I will bless you. But if you turn your back away from me, then these curses will come on you. So be faithful and trust that I have the best plan for your life. That I want you to live a holy and pure and right life. I want you to be right with me. And being right with me is living a holy and honest and pure life. And so he gave them instructions and rules to follow on how to live out that holy and pure life. He gave them the commandments. He gave them the law. And the law consisted of a lot of rules that they needed to follow. And when you, go over, when you look over the laws in the book of Deuteronomy and 
and Leviticus and all the instructions that God gave to give to the people of Israel, he gave them some, I want to say they're weird instructions, but like for instance, if you are walking along and you see something on the ground, don't keep walking by. Pick it up. If you know who it belongs to, give it to the person. Don't keep it. He gave him instructions like that. He gave him instructions if you see something lying on the ground and it's your enemies. Oh, well, I'm not going to give it to my enemy. Let them lose their thing that's very valuable to them. I don't care about it because I hate them. He didn't tell them to do that. He said, if you see something lying on the ground and it's your enemies, to pick it up and give it to them. Return it to the proper owner. Simple instructions. He gave them very detailed instructions on how to live. Simple things. He taught them morality, to have morals and ethics, to love and care for your neighbor. This was his law. His law was love and care for your neighbor, respect their possessions, respect your possessions. He gave them laws on how to handle if you had a skin rash, if there was mold growing on your wall. There were special instructions to follow because God cares about every detail of your life, even the mold on your wall, the mold in your walls, if you have a rash on your skin, even a pimple. God cares about that. And it's written about in the Bible. Because our life is not divided into sections where there is secular life and holy life. Where there's my spiritual side and then there's my secular life that after I go to church on Sunday, then my spiritual is just for these two hours while I'm here. And then when I go to my job Monday through Friday, that's my, my secular life, my, my normal life. There was no division in the Hebrew nation between this is holy this is your spiritual life, and this is your, your other life, whatever you want to call it, when you leave the church building or when you leave from being around other Christians. All of life was holy. Even when you're walking along the road and you find something that's not yours, all of it was considered holy. And so we have that he gave the instructions to people, simple instructions to follow, and if you follow these instructions and you obeyed me, which were good laws and good rules, you have to admit that there was nothing wrong with them. He was not demanding them to do any strange thing or to worship other gods. He was asking them to do right, good things for their neighbors or for one another and for him. And if they failed to obey, then, they wouldn't, then he would turn his back on them because I gave you the best instructions, so why would you not? Which is, they would disobey God by worshiping other gods who are really no god at all. God would turn his back, send, and let the surrounding nations that they failed to drive out, again being disobedient, he would allow them, those people to oppress them. So where Judges begins with Gideon. You have the people called the Midianites and the Amalekites, which are also, um, they're part of their ancestry of the Hebrew people. And so they are... They come in droves with all of their thousands, tens of thousands of people of their army. And they have all of their camels and all of their tents just sprawled out across the land of Manasseh. And Manasseh would plant their crops. The people of Manasseh would plant their crops. And then the marauders, the Amalekites, the Midianites, and other people from the east would come through and totally wipe out all of their crops. The enemy would just sit there and watch them till the ground, break up the soil, plant the seed, watch it sprout up, and they would sit there and wait and then completely destroy their entire crop. So they had nothing. Isn't it like the enemy just to sit there and to watch your life 
Watch your heart being tilled by the Word of God and being the fallow ground, the hard ground of your heart being broken up so God's Word, so His seed could be planted in it. And as soon as it starts to grow and bring forth fruit in life, the enemy wants to completely and utterly wipe it out. Because he doesn't want you bearing fruit. He's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. These marauders were thieves that came to steal, kill, and destroy every good thing that God was giving to the tribe of Israel. And so they camped. They destroyed everything that they had. They would steal their cattle, their goats, their sheep, their donkeys. They took everything away for them. For seven years they were under this oppression because they had disobeyed the Lord. But God also uses your disobedience to help discipline you, to teach you a lesson, because everything God uses for your good. So even when you make a mistake, and God disciplines you with his hand of discipline, it is for your benefit to teach you to trust and have faith, to turn to him and to turn away from idols. And so they did learn this lesson. And so that was a good thing that came out of this. And so we see Gideon, the first scene that we have of Gideon, he's in a wine press. In those days, wine presses were like big concrete, kind of looks like a big tub, a slab that would be carved into a mountain. And so you would have one that was up higher, and then one that was down another like concrete tub, basin, that was like down a little bit lower. And between the two, there was like a trough. And so the grapes of a wine press would be all placed in the upper, the upper wine press where they would be stomped on so that the juice could flow down through that little trough down to the lower one. And that's how they collected the juice from the wine, the juice from the grapes to make it into wine. And so we find Gideon that he's in the bottom of the wine press, so I assume that he would be in the lower one. And that's where he's threshing wheat because there wasn't any wine, because the harvest was destroyed, but somehow Gideon was able to save some of the wheat that he actually would be out the grain of wheat out of the husk. There's some spiritual significance in that as well. We know that when they would um, tread out the wine, it's important not to put too much pressure because you put too much pressure on the grape, then you could crush the seed. And so you have to be careful about the amount of pressure that you put onto the grape because if you crush the seed, then it releases these tannins into the juice, which makes it taste absolutely awful. God knows how much pressure to put on you, because he doesn't want to crush the seed that's in your heart. We also see that in the threshing of the wheat, God, Gideon was breaking off the chaff, which is the husk, so that the grain could fall to the ground. And so God, in our lives, will also break the husk or the chaff off of you so that what remains is the pure grain, the pure seed, the pure word of God. And so he breaks things away from us. And we will soon see that he's going to break away from Israel their idolatry. And so he's threshing the wheat, and he's threshing the bottom of the wine press so that the marauders who are in the valley, don't see that he's threshing wheat. When they threshed wheat, they would normally have to throw it up in the air and then let it fall back down. The chaff would blow away in the wind and the seed would fall down at the farmer's feet. He wasn't able to thresh up like that because they would see it going up in the air and then they would know that there was food. So he had to be careful about what he was doing. Gideon was afraid. Sometimes we're afraid. Sometimes we're afraid of our enemy. Sometimes we're afraid of the surrounding people, like Gideon was. And you'll find yourself in an unusual place, like at the bottom. And when you find yourself at the bottom, sometimes that can be lonely. And you will have fear. But an angel of the Lord appeared to him when he was at the bottom. So when you're at the bottom... God will send a word to you to give you encouragement and to lift you up. And so the angel came 
and told Gideon, who was a farmer, by the way, Gideon was a farmer, he's he has crops, he owns land. He told the farmer that you're a mighty warrior. And he said that God is going to use you to deliver the people out of the oppression, from the oppression of the Midianites. He's going to use you. And he said it, he had doubts. How are you going to use me? I'm the, we are the weakest tribe. And I'm the weakest one of my clan. How are you going to use me to defeat the enemy? And so Gideon had doubts and he had fear. And because of this, he wanted to make sure that God was really calling him to to do what he said, to defeat the, the Midianites. And so he said, well, let me go get a, I want to give you an offering. And so he went and he prepared a goat and some, some bread, and he gave it to the angel. And when and the angel told him to put it on the rock, and when he touched the rock, the rock consumed the offering that was there. And then he realized that he was in the presence of God. When he realized that he was in the presence of God, the Spirit of God came down upon him, the Bible says. And so when the Spirit of God came down upon him, he gathered ten men to come with him. And the first thing they did was that they went with, they took a bull from his father and they went to the place where they worshipped Baal and Asherah. Baal was considered the god of fertility and also the god of agriculture, and the god of storm, and they worshipped him. Israel was worshipping the gods of the surrounding nations, Baal and Asherah. And so God told him to go and take down that altar, and I want you to cut down that Asherah pole, that sacred tree that you worship Asherah, which is the goddess of heaven, the queen of heaven, which they consider to be the wife of Baal. I want you to go and cut that tree down. And I want you to pull apart that altar they have built. And then I want you to build a new altar with uncut stones and put it together the way I instructed Moses to. And I want you to take that bull and I want you to lay it down on the altar under, on top of the wood from the Asherah tree. And I want you to offer a sacrifice unto God. And so he got his ten men and he tore down the altar of Baal where they worshipped him. And they cut down the Asherah tree, and they chopped it up, and they put it on top of the altar, the new altar that he made. They laid the bull on top, and he sacrificed it, and God accepted the sacrifice. Because before you can do anything for the Lord, you need to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, and acceptable unto God. You have to confront the idols in your life, the things that you are worshiping that are other than God. And a lot of times we don't understand what idolatry is and what is an idol, and we get confused with that concept. But in reading Ephesians 5, it says all sexual immorality, every single type of impurity, and all greed is idolatry. Why is sexual immorality, any type of impurity, and greediness idolatry? Is it because you are not worshiping the true and living God? So if you're not worshiping him, then who are you worshiping? So with love and gentleness and tenderness and patience and goodness and mercy and forgiveness, this is how we transform from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We are drawn by God's love to live a new life. And God showed his love to Israel. And from this, it draws you to live a new life that is pure, that is moral, that is pure, that is giving and generous. And so the idol worship was destroyed And his father, Gideon's father, is actually the one who set up these places of worship. A lot of you might not be familiar with that, that his father 
is the one who erected the altar to Baal. His father is the one who made the Asherah pole there. His father was one of the leaders of worship to these false gods. So he had to confront his family with their idolatry. He had to stand up to his family. And a lot of times that can be a fearful thing for somebody, is to stand up to members of their own family and to tell them, this is not the way. This is not the way. I want to show you a better way because this is harming you. This is hurtful for your life. It causes death, destruction, and misery because we can see all around that our idol worship has caused our starvation. It has caused this famine in this land. It has caused our poverty. This idol worship is destroying us. Wake up. Wake up, you who are sleeping. This idolatry has caused destruction in our land, and we need to have it stopped. We need to turn back to the way that is right and holy and honest and true. And so we tore down those places of worship because we need, we need to worship God. We need to worship the one and true God who has given us power over all the power of the enemy. And he said, I will go before you and I will go with you and I will drive them out and I will be your God and you will be my people. You are my inheritance. You are my special possession. You are my special treasure and I love you. These other gods can't even speak. They have no voice. But I care about you. And so he tore down those altars. And the whole city was mad. They were all mad at him. His family was mad at him. His brothers were mad at him. They wanted to kill him. But his father had a conversion. And he said, if Baal is really a god, then he'll fight his own battle. If Baal's upset that my son tore down this altar, well then let him fight with him. You leave him alone. And so because of his father's support, he had 10,000 men, 22,000 men that joined him. And God was sending the 22,000 to go and invade the Midianites' territory, and to destroy them. But God looked and he said, this people is too many. We need to dwindle it down a little bit more. And so he said, tell the ones who are afraid to go home. So he told all the ones that were afraid to go home. And so 10,000 were left. And he said, this is still too many because if I defeat the Midianites with 10,000 people, they might say it's by my own power, that we defeated the enemy. So I'm going to test them at the water. So bring them to the water. And so they went to the water, and he told them every, everyone that picks up the water with their hands and laps from it like a dog, separate those from the ones who kneel down to the river to drink. And so he separated them. And the ones who scooped up the water in their hands and lapped it up like a dog with their tongue were the ones that he used to go and fight the battle and that was 300 men. So the 300 of them, God was going to use to fight the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east. And so God told them that, gave them special instructions and said, I want you to go. They're in your hands. I'm giving them over to you. But he said, if you're afraid, take Pura with you. So he told him to go and fight, I'm with you, and you're going to win. But if you're afraid, take, my, take your servant Pura. God cares even when you're afraid. He didn't hold it against Gideon that he was afraid, because a lot of things that we have to face, we are afraid to face them. There's many things in your life that you're going to be afraid to face or have to deal with some hard things that are going to come your way and you're going to have to stand up. But if you're afraid, 
Take Pura with you. Take somebody with you if you're afraid. Sometimes we need something tangible. We want, to, we actually, we want God to go with us. We want, we want to see God's face. We want to be able to take God with us. We want to have tangible, physical presence of God to go with us. But we don't have that. But I have you. I might not see God face to face, but I see my God in your face. I see my God in you. I see his strength in you. I see his character in you. I see his wisdom in you. I see his spirit in you. I see his understanding, his love, and his gentleness, and his mercy, and his grace, and his forgiveness in your face. Will you go with me? Because I can't face this alone. Because it's too hard for me. But in your face, I see God. And so God allows that. Moses had Aaron. Gideon had Pura. Can I blow your mind with one more thing? Guess what Pura means? It's a branch. Foliage, a green branch with foliage. Pura was a branch. Isaiah 11, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or de decide by what he hears with his ears, because sometimes what we see and what we hear can be deceiving. We might see an army before us, thousands upon thousands upon thousands but we know with one we can put a thousand to flight. But me and Pura, we could put 10,000 to flight. Will you go with me? But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. And we see God judging the needy with righteousness. He judged the surrounding nations after oppressing them for seven years. He will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, the branch of Jesse, will stand as a banner for the peoples, the nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. Pura, the branch, going with you, by your side. His knowledge, his wisdom, his power, his strength, going with you, going before you, leading you, guiding you, giving you wisdom, giving you counsel. This is how you're going to defeat the enemy in your life. This is spiritual warfare. Your battle is not against flesh and blood. Your battle is against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness and high places. So don't forget, in your warfare and in your battle and your struggles that you're dealing with in your life, 
It's not against people. This is a spiritual warfare. It's a spiritual battle. The enemy is battling for your soul. But you have the righteous branch who is with you to give you wisdom and counsel and to guide you and to lead you, to keep you out of the paths that would lead astray and to lead you to the path that leads you to him. You are the light of the world. We must walk in the light as children of the light and shine our light for all to see so that we might save some from the hand of the enemy, so that our lives might be fruitful and productive, so that we can have a harvest so it's not destroyed, so that we can lie down in safety, so that we can live the abundant life that God has given to us and the, that God has promised us. And to move away from living a life of fear, but to face those demons in our life, to face those obstacles, to face the enemy, to face the thing that you're afraid of, and you don't have to be afraid because God is with you. Take Pura with you. He will make you victorious. Don't go alone. You can't face this alone. That's why God placed us in community. He gave us one another because you can't do this alone. You can't face this life alone. You can't face your struggle alone. Share it with someone and bring them with you. And all the Puras out there, walk with them. God is in you for a reason. We can't keep that light to ourselves and we can't keep it hidden. God, we thank you, Lord, for today. God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. God, we pray that you help us, Lord, to stand next to one another and to hold one another up when we're weak, when we're down, when we need a friend, when we need advice and counsel and help and support and encouragement, gentleness, tenderness, sensitivity. God, we pray that you help us, Lord, Help us to be that branch for someone else. Help us, God, to turn to you when we need help and strength. Help us, God, to take time to focus on what's important in life, Lord. To follow the right way that is true. To turn from to turn from the way of idolatry and worshiping the true God. God, we pray for your blessing upon this congregation gathered here today. We pray that you help us to be a community of love and of unity and of peace, a place that is safe, where all can be healed and made whole and helped where all of us who are struggling with our own issues can be gently helped and led onto the right path so we can behold your glory, Lord, and to see you at work in our lives. We praise you this day, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.